I'm very happy today to have Manuel uh, speech in here. As you know, uh, uh, the ritual um, introduction requires, um, I have to point out that Manuel um, is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oxford. And um, I think in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, uh, um, you, Manuel, won the Sir Henry Welcome Postdoc Postdoctoral Fellowship, uh, but you were coming that same year from uh, Stanford uh, and previously from Philadelphia, which is actually where you graduated in the Department of Psychology. Um, I will not go too much into what is he going to talk about because that's actually the reason you are here, so you will hear yourself. I just wanted to point out that uh, 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 Dr. Spitschen is one of those people that it's really worthwhile uh, following on, on Twitter because there he, he carries on some very nice and well done uh, work or in outreach and uh, organizing and managing workshops and conferences and it's very, very interesting. Um, so you can see the Twitter handle on the, on the first slide. So without further ado, please, Manuel, stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you so, so much for this kind introduction. Uh, and also thank you for, for having me today. It's very exciting to be uh, here and, and to talk a little bit about my research. Um, so I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards as well. Um, I'll be talking about what the human eye tells the human clock. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is really tie together different strands of work that I've been doing to kind of reach an integrative understanding of how photoreceptors uh, control uh, our behavioral entrainment to the light dark cycle. Uh, again, this is my Twitter handle. So if you want to follow me, please do. Uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge the many uh, people that I've had the pleasure and pr privilege of working with over the last couple of years, as well as my funders. And it's, it should be clear that without all of these people and funders, this work shouldn't, would, wouldn't have been possible. Now, the focus of today's talk will be the effects of light on human visual and non-visual physiology. Uh, and so I have basically a couple of uh, projects that I want to discuss today or, or, or talk about today. Um, and it's kind of a, I'd, I'd say, cumulative or sequential approach that I'm taking here. So the first bit that I'll be talking about will be, uh, of course, the introduction, the selective characterization of photoreceptor signals is the next, then understanding how different photoreceptors are involved in circadian and neuroendocrine physiology and then moving a little bit out towards the real world to understand how light exposure affects non-visual physiology in the real world. So I want to start with really uh, the bread and butter of, of what I've been doing which is the selective characterization of photoreceptor signals in the living human eye. So this is a, 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 a diagram that should be very familiar to you uh, if not from high school biology um, light enters the eye through the lens, passes through up to the optical media, and then hits the fine layer of nerve cells at the back of the eye called the retina. And that's really where all vision and all non-visual effects of light start. In the photoreceptor layer of the, of the retina, there's the rods, which enable us to see rudimentarily at night. And there's the cones, which give us, you know, cone, uh, daylight, daylight, vision in daylight. So mo vision of uh, space, motion, detail, etc. In addition to these classical photoreceptors, there's another class of photoreceptors, and these are the intrinsically photosensitive retinoganglion cells. So these were only discovered about 20 years ago, um, it's uh, or 25 to 20 years ago. So it's a relatively new discovery in, in neuroscience. Um, and therefore it's quite exciting actually to be working specifically on this topic. These intrinsically photosensitive retinoganglion cells are, uh, they have a, the, the, they express a photopigment called melanopsin, which is short wavelength sensitive. Um, and they are light sensitive independent of any cone and rod input. So you have some clinical conditions, for example, which you have full or complete, near complete rod cone loss, but still signals in these IPRGCs. Signals from the IPRGCs then mediate the various non-visual effects of light. So if you've been thinking a little bit, a lot about vision, there's a whole other uh, suite of of physiological functions uh, that these IPRGCs are, are serving. One of them is melatonin suppression. So the suppression of the production of melatonin by light, shifting of circadian phase. There's some evidence that IPRGCs directly control sleep as well. 
um, acute alertness as well as temperature regulation. So all kind of, uh, you might call them physiological or vegetative functions related to, to light. Uh, and all of this is mediated by the retinal hypothalamic pathway, which basically connects the retina to the hypothalamus. And the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, is the, the circadian pacemaker, uh, where all these neural signals are combined. Because the retina is involved, obviously the next question, or the, the natural first question should be, well, how can we examine the role of different photoreceptors in these various processes? And really what I'm gonna present here is a, is a suite of techniques or suite of methods that enable us to tease apart what are the contributions of the different photoreceptors. Now, if you were working with animals, there's obviously a suite of genetic tools that might be available. Um, so for example, you might consider a rod cone knockout and you might ask the question, well, which function is preserved in the absence of rods and cones? The flip side of that is obviously a, um, a melanopsin knockout where you might ask, well, which function is deficient in the absence of melanopsin? Um, and so these are sort of broadly speaking, obviously very, very simplified views of the types of genetic techniques that might be available in animal studies. In humans, obviously these techniques aren't really available. Um, and so we have to be a little bit more creative. I should put a really a, a caveat here because I will talk about some work that I've done recently where um, we are looking effectively at a knockout in, in humans. Um, so the human retina, the healthy or the normal human retina has three classes of cones, the L cones, the M cones, the S cones, the ROTs, and then the IPRGCs. One of the things that we can exploit experimentally is that their spectral sensitivities are overlapping. Um, so on the x-axis here is wavelength from 380 to 780. And on the y-axis, this gives us the relative sensitivity of these photoreceptors. Um, and so basically this tells us at a given wavelength, how sensitive a given photoreceptor class is. Um, the flip side of this is obviously they're overlapping. So it's very hard to find a single light, a single wavelength that will stimulate only one photoreceptor class. So if you take, for example, a light that has the maximum power at around 480 nanometers, uh, which will maximally stimulate melanopsin, this will also stimulate obviously the other photoreceptors. And so if the goal is to, to design a stimulus that, that has the property that it, select, that it allows us to selectively characterize what different photoreceptors are doing, then single wavelength lights are just very limited. There are some edge cases, right? So you can go to really, really short wavelength lights. You can go to really, really long wavelength light where effectively the photoreceptor sensitivity of the other photoreceptors will be zero for, I mean, you have a, a very, very much L cone bias light pulse, but that's really kind of only at the ends of the spectrum. And so all single wavelength lights uh, basically affect all photoreceptors. So to overcome this, what we can do is we can exploit the principle of univariance. So this is a, uh, principle in, in, uh, in photobiology or visual, visual uh, neuroscience really, which tells us that um, at the level of the photoreceptor, the photoreceptor cannot distinguish between changes in wavelength and changes in sensitivity. So these are three hypothetical lights, monochromatic light sources, I'll call them E1, E2, and E3. And basically what the photoreceptor is doing um, in a kind of uh, intuitive way, it's basically taking the spectrum of the light and it's weighting it by its spectral sensitivity. And so as a consequence, these three lights, if you do this numerical operation, will produce the same output. And so even though they're obviously different in wavelength and in intensity, the photoreceptor will only produce the scalar univariate output. And as a consequence, cannot distinguish between changes in wavelength and changes in intensity. So we can exploit this then experimentally. So this is a, an example for two photoreceptors where we have uh, melanopsin and S cones, a hypothetical retina. Um, we can find two lights that have this, that basically stimulate the S cones in the same way, producing the same scalar output. But because the spectral sensitivities are different, we will basically get differential stimulation of melanopsin. And so at the photoreceptor response level, we have matched the S cone excitation and we find that we, we produce a difference uh, in, in melanopsin excitation because it's the stimulated versus the silent photoreceptors. And this is where the term silent sub substitution comes from, which is uh, the name of this technique. Um, obviously the human retina contains five photoreceptors or four under photopic conditions. Uh, and so we have to, we can scale this up like this. We would start with a background spectrum 
which is you know, a, a relatively broad spectrum in this case. Um, we can then increase the power in light near the peak of melanopsin. This basically increases the activation of all photoreceptors, not quite what we want, but we've at least in introduced an increase in melanopsin excitation. Now to balance out, let's start with the S cones, uh, we can basically reduce power and near in the short wavelength range, this produces now a silenced S cone. So if you alternate it between these two spectra, the red spectrum and the dashed spectrum, that would produce no signal on the S cones. But obviously we still have the L and M cones to work to, to deal with. And so what we can do is we can decrease power to silence the L and M cones. Now, unfortunately, we have flipped the sign of contrast here, but we can basically do a little bit of wiggling towards longer wavelength, uh, towards the longer wavelengths, which then has the consequence that the LMS cones are silenced and we hope we have a, stim, uh, uh, a differential contrast in melanopsin. You'll, you've also, you'll probably also see that there's a non-zero signal on the rods here. We're assuming this is all done under photopic light levels where rods do not contribute. So, this is basically the paradigm of silent substitution, which, which I'll, I'll come back to a couple of times during this talk. And it really enables us to tease apart using spectral power distributions that are designed in such a way uh, that they stimulate only one photoreceptor class, what these photoreceptors are doing in, in, in the living human eye. So when I talk about a study that I ran a couple of years ago where we looked at the photoreceptor inputs into pupil control. So the pupil um, is a, uh, an organ that's obviously very reactive to light intuitively when it's, when it's bright outside, pupil is small, when it's dim, pupil is big. Um, what we can exploit is what's called the consensual pupillary light reflex. We can stimulate one eye that is under pharmacological dilation. So using eye drops uh, and then observe the response in the other eye. So we can basically have a very well controlled retinal stimulus in the one eye and then see uh, how that translates to uh, changes in pupil size, which reflect then the neural activity in the retina. What we did here was to uh, basically characterize the temporal response of uh, the pupil in response uh, or the, the temporal response of the pupil uh, across different photoreceptor modulations. So what the first, so what we did, we modulated a photopigment at a given temporal frequency, in this case, a 0.1 Hertz spectral modulation. We recorded the pupil responses over many, many trials, and then we averaged across trials. And so you get, you end up with an average time course um, that basically, obviously all the noise that you might have in individual trials is averaged out. We then fit a sinusoid at the modulation frequency and that, will, that will, this will basically allow us to then characterize the uh, the amplitude and phase of the pupil response. So just a little bit kind of a sneak or quick peek at the uh, looking at the data. We examined here uh, four different photoreceptor directions across six different temporal frequencies. Um, S-cone isolating, melanopsin isolating, L plus M, so luminance, and then an isochromatic modulation that stimulates all photoreceptors. And we use frequencies between 0.01 Hertz and two Hertz. And so this is a 100 second cycle. Right? So it's very, very slow uh, sinusoidal modulation. And this is a very, obviously a very fast temp a sinusoidal modulation. What I'm showing you here is the average pupil traces across one cycle of the stimulus. So the time bases for these, uh, for these uh, single panels here, um, for the single lines are different. Um, but basically you can see quite clearly for the L and M cones, um, this very characteristic response that you have. So this is um, in a constriction of the pupil and then a redilation of the pupil that's linked to the, to the sinusoidal change in contrast. Let's zoom in on this. So this is the stimulus. We have an increase in contrast uh, and then a decrease in contrast, which leads to a constriction of the pupil and then a dilation of the pupil. As I mentioned before, we can extract amplitude, which is how much um, the pupil respond and then the phase, which obviously gives us the temporal relationship uh, between the stimulus and the physiological response. We can summarize this in this polar plot representation where um, radial eccentricity corresponds to the, uh, the amplitude uh, and the angle corresponds to the phase. Let's start with putting some points down. So this is data from 16 subjects for the L plus M modulation. So the luminance modulation, um, we can see, you know, relatively tight clustering or in aggregate tight clustering of these, of these responses. 
uh, in one quadrant. This is normalized to the complex sum of individual responses. So we're basically normalizing out any large scale differences in pupil reactivity across participants. Now let's add the melanopsin uh, modulation to this. And so we can see this very interesting sort of um, quadrature phase relationship between L plus M and melanopsin. Um, and then the final point or the final data point that we want to add is the S cones. And so this is quite an interesting data point because uh, or the interesting group of data points, because um, we can look at the literature and basically generate some predictions of where these points should fall in this polar plot. So if you look at the literature, um, we know that there's inhibitory S cone inputs into IPRGCs. So S cones provide a negative uh, signal to the IPRGCs. And so if we think this circuitry is also true for pupil control, uh, we would expect these points to be falling in this quadrant, basically opposite phase, 180 degrees out of phase with L and M cones. And indeed, in aggregate, that's the case. So we find an S cone opponency in the pupil response. Um, so what does that mean? What does this S cone opponency mean? It's quite interesting. So basically, means um, you have an in, if you have an increase in S cone contrast, that leads to a dilation of the pupil, which is quite so it's also called a paradoxical pupil response. Um, it is counterintuitive in the sense that typically you would have an increase in the contrast or an increase in light and the constriction of the pupil. For the S cones, it's flipped. It's a flipped, uh, the sign is flipped in the response. Uh, we replicated the same effect in for a different temporal frequency, this time for 0.5 Hertz. Um, and you know, we, we, we see again this tight clustering and the, the, the opposite phase uh, response of S cones in aggregate. And this was also um, replicated by other groups. Fortunately, this is quite a, it was quite rewarding to see other groups finding a similar effect using different stimuli. So these were pulses. So both Walders and uh, Murray uh, found these S cone opponent uh, pupil responses, but also interestingly, an M cone opponent and paradoxical pupil response. The other thing that we can look at within this data set, so this is data from a relatively low number of subjects for this part, um, because it takes a long time to collect this, is the temporal transfer function. So on the x-axis here, we have the temporal frequency. On the y-axis, we have amplitude. So how much does the pupil size change in response to sinusoidal flicker at different temporal frequencies? And so you see this very characteristic bandpass curve for L plus M. Uh, this is fitted using the Watson 1986 um, temporal filter model, and then we see bandpass responses for S cones and melanopsin. This is one subject, it's about, I think, 50 hours worth of data. Uh, we see the same or very similar pattern uh, for another subject. And of course, there's a little bit of individual differences perhaps in the reactivity to different photoreceptor modulations and also the amplitude change is different a little bit. So we find this S cone opponency and it's quite interesting because you know what? What might be used? What? Why would a an S cone opponent pupil response be useful? Uh, we hypothesized a little bit, or speculate, speculated more um, that this might be useful for detecting changes in the light environment uh, at dawn and dusk, right? So we obviously have when we're looking at uh, the, the natural illumination, and when we're looking at natural illumination, the sun goes down. But there's another thing that's happening, which is the the, the change in spectrum. Right? The spectrum is a little bit shifted towards short wavelength lights, which would be ideal, you know, ideally picked up by this cone opponent process. But that's obviously a hypothesis and very, very hard to test. Now, these were relatively, um, I'd say, well-controlled studies. We can obviously also scale up this principle of silent substitution and make the stimuli a little bit more interesting. So what we did here, we used the two projectors that had effectively five different primaries and we superimposed photoreceptor modulations on top of this cartoon. And so even there, you can see um, these characteristic pupil responses um, in stimuli that are basically hidden in, in, a, in an entertaining uh, Tom and Jerry cartoon. Um, what about steady state pupil size? I've only talked about really the kind of dynamic uh, pupil size. So, you know, the pupil response to flicker. This is, I think, one of my favorite uh, videos that I've probably ever produced in my scientific career. Uh, five different subjects under dark adaptations, the top row, and then under some light adaptation is the bottom row. And you can see not only they're obviously blinking a lot uh, in, a, in, a, in an interesting st stochastic fashion, but also you see individual differences um, in absolute pupil size under both dark and light adapted conditions. And I think that's quite interesting. 
uh, in, from a kind of individual differences perspective. If you look at steady state pupil size, uh, this is data that was reanalyzed from a paper that was published in Nature in 1962, where the main contribution was basically measuring pupil size as a function of or in response to different monochromatic lights. Because they're monochromatic, we can basically convert them into a melanopsin weighted quantity. Uh, and so if you do that, you do see that the pupil size is relatively well described by this melanopsin photoreceptor. Um, and it's interesting, I think there's a there's a note in this paper saying, you know, it looks like this is neither cones nor rods. Um, so it might be an, a previously undiscovered process. Obviously, this precedes the discovery of IPRGCs by about 40 years. Um, with this technique of sound substitution, we can also then measure cortical responses. So this is a study we ran looking at the fMRI bold response. Um, so effectively, melanopsin being a photoreceptor in the retina, the question here was, can we measure any cortical uh, signals, any cortical responses to stimuli that are biased or designed to stimulate only melanopsin? And it turns out you can, and the size of the response or the amplitude of the response isn't really, uh, cannot really explain by uncertainty in the stimulus. So it looks like there's a cortical contribution of these melanopsin signals. Obviously, there's still a lot more work to do, I think, on the psychophysics of this. Um, I think the challenge is a little bit this problem of, you know, the human vision is very, or human color vision is very sensitive to red-green modulations. And so the um, any change, any small change in spectrum that loads on the L minus M axis will be quite visible to, to observers. I want to talk about a little bit about the work that, that I've done since doing these relatively careful uh, parametric investigations of melanopsin signals in vision to talking a little bit about different photoreceptor contributions in circadian and neuroendocrine physiology. So we start with the view that there's the IPRGCs and the IPRGCs are involved in non-visual physiology. Um, but what about the cones and rods? So we know that cones and rods are contributing in some way to IPRGC signals. The circuitry that basically uh, or, you know, the circuitry enables synaptic input from cones and rods to feed into the IPRGCs. So can we find a, any evidence for a rod and cone contribution in these processes um, or in, in non-visual physiology? Really? Um, so I'll talk about two studies here that I ran recently looking at the role of S cones and the role of rods. So let's take a look, about the, take a look at the S cones first. So S cones are short wavelength sensitive. Uh, they're independent of melanopsin, of course, and we wanted to know, do S cones contribute to melatonin suppression? And there were really two motivating data points here. One was the previously observed S cone opponent pupil response, indicating that there might be an S cone contribution in these other non-visual functions, but also um, existing data on the short wavelength sensitivity in, in action spectrum measurements for melatonin suppression. So an action spectrum measurement here would be, you know, you put people under some monochromatic light and you ask, well, how much does that light uh, suppress the production of melatonin? So if you look at the data that exists there, um, in one of the data sets, you do see um, an ESCON or not a short wavelength sensitivity that isn't really well described by the melanopsin photoreceptor, which obviously could point to an ESCON contribution. It's in one data set, but not the other. So it's a little bit of mixed, a little bit mixed evidence, I would say, for that. But we really wanted to see, well, can we design stimuli that are um, only stimulating S cones um, that might produce a difference in melatonin production. So the stimuli that we designed here again were silent substitution stimuli, two pa a pair of lights that differed only in the amount of S cone or only in S cone excitation by almost two log units, right? So almost a factor of 100, a factor of 83, um, with very, very little difference in uh, an M cone, L cone, rod, and melanopsin activation. Uh, we exposed participants to these lights in the evening in an evening protocol for a total of 80 minutes. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is uh, in the Center for Coronabiology in Basel. Uh, this is, uh, you'll, be, you'll be looking at this, this, this light source. This is the S minus, the S cone depleted condition. And then when you have the other, the, the other light on, which produces a two order of magnitude difference in S cone excitation, obviously the color will change because the S cones also contribute to color vision. Right, so there's a little bit of a, a difference in color appearance, which obviously cannot be overcome because s contribute to color. So with these stimuli in hand, we then measured uh, salivary melatonin production 
So I'll just jump right into the data. Uh, this is the typical profile in, on average for melatonin production in the evening. Um, the white bar here is showing us when the, the light exposure was on. And so what you can see here is that basically there's no meaningful or significant difference in melatonin production between the two lighting conditions, which were S minus and S plus. So an almost two order of magnitude difference in S connective activation does not produce an, an appreciable uh, effect in melatonin production. We also looked at other indicators. We looked at sleepiness and vigilant attention, um, where also we couldn't find a significant difference uh, in either of these metrics. So overall then, at least under the conditions that we studied, we find no evidence for an S-cone effect in, um, in melatonin suppression. There's a little bit of other data that we have here. So visual comfort, brightness, preference, glare, and color temperature. There's obviously a difference in the perceived color temperature between the two conditions, but also I think this is interesting. You do see a overall a, a decrease in, gen, in the rate of self-reported general well-being of, uh, of the participants over the evening, which then, when you know one sample before they can leave, has a little bit of an uptake uptick. Now, so this is the cones. I think in some we or the S cones, and some I think we have no evidence then that the S cones contribute to this process, which I think coming back to the original data probably asked, poses the question, well, maybe there are certain conditions which facilitate the detection of an S-cone effect. Um, and I think we probably need to fully, fully map out the, the entire stimulus space to understand, is, are there any conditions in which you might be able to find this S-cone effect? Now, the other study that I wanna talk about concerns the rods. Um, so the rods are very, very light sensitive. They saturate under daylight conditions. And this is a study um, I mentioned earlier knockouts. Um, this is a study uh, with a um, group of congenital achromats. And it's a very, very rare retinal inherited, inherited retinal disorder that is characterized by a lack of functional cones. It's a very, um, so you only have about one in 30,000 to one in 50,000 of people have this. Um, and so we're, we're quite happy that we were able to work with this group of people um, to, to try to, to try to try to, to try to understand what the role of the rods are in circadian photoreception. If you have con congenital achromatopsia, um, you are very, very light sensitive. And that is because um, the rods basically are, the rods and the IPRGCs are the only photoreceptors that are functional. And the rods saturate at, a, at relatively low daytime light levels. So effectively what that means is the dynamic range that you might have uh, available in the normal human human retina uh, is basically cut in half simply because uh, the rods can no longer signal any changes in light above this uh, above this sort of detection of the rod saturation threshold. And if you read sort of subjective accounts of what this means uh, to people with congenital achromatopsia, it basically means that, you know, their vision during daytime, daytime is not very comfortable, but it's also washed out. And so as a consequence, these people often take uh, wear shades of, of visual, of basically spectacles, uh, glasses that have specific filters that basically reduce the amount of ro rod excitation. Now, the interesting bit experimentally that's, that's, that's a little bit challenging is that rods and melanopsin, rod and melanopsin signals are correlated because the spectral sensitivities are so close. Um, and as a consequence, then any of these visual filters that are commonly used, so these are the two commonly used prescribed filters, F540 and F90, they reduce the, they obviously reduce the rod activation, but they also reduce the melanopsin, act the activation of melanopsin. And so as a consequence then, um, if you're thinking about light being the driver of circadian photo entrainment that's mediated through melanopsin, the amplitude of the melanopsin signal will be severely reduced in these participants that will have no functional cone vision because you know, they, they will be avoiding bright lights that are generally thought to, to support circadian photo entrainment. Um, we can measure visual discomfort. This is work that was done with one participant. Obviously, you know, the light, the brighter the light, the more discomfortable we were able to measure some differences in pupil sizes. It's just sort of one, one participant, so more anecdotal data. Um, the key thing that we wanted to look at was, is there any evidence for circadian and sleep disruption in congenital achromatopsia? So if you look at um, scientific literature, there's basically nothing on this. You can find a New York Times article that says that many with the disorder are proud night owls who love going out after dark. There's no reference um, to circadian or sleep phenotype in the handbook 
on congenital achromatopsia. Um, and what's really interesting is that it's, it's not like other types of blindness where you might have some melatonin suppression, but no light aversion or photophobia, right? So you will find in some, some blind participants who have no cones or rods that they will suppress the production or light exposure will suppress the production of melatonin. Um, but they will also not be experiencing light as something that's not very comfortable. We worked with seven participants here uh, who had all had the confirmed genotype. In general, we see these are standard instruments for assessment of sleep, chronotype visual function. Um, we do see a little bit of a tendency for, uh, for sleep problems, a tendency for later chronotype, uh, as well as high levels of visual discomfort, which is kind of what you would expect. It also supports what uh, the idea that was in that New York Times article. But obviously self-reported questionnaires is very different from the type of objective data that we would like to have. And so what we ended up doing is uh, running a three-week actimetry or actigraphy study along with a sleep diary where participants wore these acti watches that measure activity and light exposure. These are just data from the six participants that participated in this. You can see um, the, the, the um, yellow bands here correspond to the sort of daytime um, periods. And you can see generally, you know, that activity falls well within daytime, right? So you can see good evidence for circadian or behavior, at least behavioral rest, rest activity cycles that have a period of near 24 hours. We can obviously summarize this in a certain way. So you do see uh, the, the convincing effect that you have no activity or less activity in the evening or at night actually, and then daytime activity. Um, so overall, then we see regular rest activity cycles and some evidence for social jet lag. There are some analyses that are missing here, but I think there is compelling evidence that we do see um, regular rest activity cycles. You can obviously look at the period uh, periodogram for this to ask, well, is the activity really 24, hour, 24 hours or something else? And yes, it is. So it's, it's, it's a very um, convincing case that there, is, um, there are 24 hour or behavioral rest activity cycles that are um, have a 24 hour period. Now the question is, is this true due to true circadian entrainment in quotation marks or something else? And so what we did here was we used the, the best biomarker for circadian rhythmicity or circadian entrainment, which is the dim light melatonin onset, the increase of melatonin in the evening using this at home protocol. So this is the data from one subject uh, prior to habitual bedtime, think three hours prior to habitual, habitual bedtime, you see this sharp increase in melatonin production. We found this in four participants um, in this at-home protocol, and we couldn't find it in two. And it's, um, it's two possibilities here. The, both of these participants uh, were elderly above the age of uh, 65, and it is known that melatonin production is somewhat suppressed in elderly participants. They were also taking beta blockers, which also, again, uh, reduced the production of melatonin. Um, but there is obviously a, um, it could also be, right, this is the, uh, I'd say, a more complicated hypothesis that we were just too early, and they might have had a melatonin increase at a later point, but that's obviously nothing that the data can tell us here. So we found normal DILMO, DL, uh, dim light melatonin onset in four participants. Overall, I think this kind of um, suggests that rods, uh, so, how do, what do we make of this data with the, rod, with the congenital achromats? I think to me, it basically suggests that there is um, probably, I guess the, the first order inference is that, you know, a functional cone system is not necessary to support uh, entrainment of the circadian system, but also that possibly the, there's an adaptation process that basically scales the range of signals um, that you might have available into uh, you know, the normal expected range, right? So if you're always getting exposed to a reduced light, uh, light exposure uh, because you, you're modifying it with filters, well, maybe you're normalizing your responses to that um, uh, over basically as a, as a long-term adaptation process. I wanna talk a little bit about light exposure in the real world, which I think is quite an important and interesting area, I'd say of research. Um, so, as humans, we're, we're exposed to very, very different types of light sources, right? So on the left hand here, I'm showing you a couple of daylights uh, that have different correlated color temperatures, so different cloud uh, coverage. Um, and then on the right hand side, here, I'm showing you different artificial lights that all uh, 
they all have different spectra, right? Specifically on the right-hand side, but they all have a very, very similar correlated color temperature. And obviously, this demonstrates that you know the spectrum, spectra might look different, but to the human eye, they they will look the same. And so we what we developed was this concept of a spectral diet, which basically um, is characterizing the um, totality of light exposure as a function of time available to a human observer. Um, basically, you can think of this relatively theoretical construct as a hyperspectral image movie, or so an hyperspectral image of, of, uh, of the retinal image over time. Um, this is something that I think would be really, really great to measure. We have some pilot data on this. So basically habitual light exposures um, here you can have, so the wavelength axis now is on the, on the y-axis and we have local time here. You can do interesting dimensionality reduction techniques to kind of pick out characteristic spectra that you might get exposed to. And so it's pretty clear that we have daylights and electric lights even in this, in this pilot data set here. And the key thing then would be to basically relate this to physiological indicators such as um, activity or you know, uh, temperature, et cetera. And obviously we can do the careful uh, characterization of what the photoreceptor signals are as well. That's obviously not a new uh, new idea. Similar ideas have been around. Uh, and it's, you know, if you if you do a little bit of introspection, it's not very complicated to come up with this concept of the spectral diet. But it's certainly something that you know we think is quite important when we're thinking about optimizing the availability to light to really su support circadian entrainment. Um, there's certain types of light sources that exhibit statistical regularity, right? So spe the spectral power distribution of daylight is relatively statistically constrained. Um, you can basically uh, do but you know, reconstruct daylights with a PCA like procedure. Um, so you have a mean and two orthogonal components and you can basically describe a horizontal irradiance using this, this low dimensional model. This can be obviously be expanded as well to, um, to other situations. So twilight, for example, we developed a, an extension of this uh, CIE model for daylight to account for changes in twilight as well. Now, coming back to real world uh, visual physiology, um, I think this is relatively recent. So, this is relatively recent work where we really try to measure physiological signals and the inputs into the retina in the real world. Um, and we're motivated here by the observation that parametric measurements of physiological responses can only go so far, in quotation marks, in predicting uh, what would happen in a real world light exposure. And so, this is and a device that we threw together using an eye tracker and a spectrometer, it's all connected with a battery pack. So you can basically do ambulatory measurements. Uh, people can go outside and measure this. It looks, it's a little clunky because you have the, the spectrometer on the head, but it's as close as, as we can be to measuring um, the, the retinal input. So in this experiment, then we measured basically under relatively normal conditions in the real world, the pupil uh, size depends on the melanopic irradiance, and we can see here quite convincingly is that, you know, the pupil, uh, pupil size is smaller, the brighter it is, as you would expect. But again, this is not laboratory work, right? This is measured in the real world where you have a lot of noise. Um, and also both in the input and the output, right? So the pupil is a very sensitive uh, organ, but it's also the case that, you know, the same point on the x-axis here would correspond to a very, very different uh, uh, lighting scenarios, for example. But we're quite happy with this and quite quite intrigued by the possibility of then going out into real world situations and really measuring and characterizing well what is the type of light that an individual will receive over the course of the day. Uh, this is we have a stage one reg registered report that's accepted on this topic, and so we'll be looking to do some more measurements sometime soon on this. Another line of work that I'm involved in is looking at generating ways to create real world visual stimuli. So. Generally speaking, RGB monitors cannot reproduce melanopsin signals, or at least we cannot control them because you have three lights and you would need at least four lights to do that. And also not, we, obviously we cannot reproduce the dynamic range of radiances in the real world. And so we recently developed with a team in Cambridge, a, a high dynamic range uh, monitor with six primaries uh, that will allow us to stimulate the photoreceptors and the, cone, uh, the cones and the melanopsin isolation. Uh, this is published in JOSA A uh, relatively recently, and we're looking to do some more empirical work with this system soon. 
Now, I just want to close with a short outlook um, for the field. Um, one of the things that we've been interested in is kind of, or I've been interested in is kind of, how, you know, generating a, a science landscape or a science, or, you know, developing capacity in a science ecosystem for, for open and transparent data. And so one of the things that we published last year was this uh, guidance, how you should report light exposure in uh, human chronobiology and sleep research experiments. So what are the input parameters that you really need to capture? And obviously this is quite important for, um, for making science reproducible. I'm also working currently on a web platform to quantify some of these effects of light that should come online sometime in early 2021. Again, with the same goal of kind of trying to make open up a little bit the, the reporting and the transparency in which we do our science. Um, I just want to close with kind of this, this slide, which, which um, I, I think kind of ties together at least my mental model of how different, you know, different types of knowledge are generated that speak to this question of how um, the, the clock is controlled by the retina. You have different disciplines, obviously, that work on what happens in the eye and the retina and the visual system, and another set of disciplines that work on the internal clock. And I do think that it is probably high time to integrate uh, these approaches into what I'll tentatively call the KE visual neuroscience. And otherwise, um, that's me. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions.